as all its sons away. Let us pray. Almighty God, watch over us this day and bless us. May we hear the things we need to hear that we might become the people we need to be. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's in uh, the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that we read that there is a time and place for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. And there are a handful of scripture passages that almost everybody knows, including those who never darken a church door, and this is one of them. It was made famous way back in the 1960s by a, a singing group called The Birds. Uh, they called their song, Turn, Turn, Turn. How many of you know the song? Almost everybody does. And uh, the lyrics are taken directly, word from word, from the book of Ecclesiastes. It was actually Pete Seeger who wrote it in the late 1950s, but it was the birds that made it famous. Well, Ecclesiastes is about the one great leveler that affects all of life, and that is time. I think the most famous verse written about time came from Omar Khayyam. He was a Persian, a philosopher, and a mathematician, lived about a thousand years ago, and his epic poem was called The Rubiat. It, of course, was written in Persian, but translated into English by Edward Fitzgerald. And the famous line from his poem goes this way. The moving finger writes, and having writ, moves on. Nor all thy piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line. Nor all thy tears wash out a word of it. And Omar Khayyam put his finger on what bothers us most about the passing of time, and that is the knowledge that we can never return to what went before and undo something we did or do something we did not. It would be interesting if we could go around the room this morning and have each of you say what you might do differently if only you could. It would be interesting to say if there's anybody here who would say, I wouldn't change a thing. I have no regrets. I've had a couple of people say that to me over the years. In each case, it was a guy. <laughs> Never had a woman say that to me, which is interesting. But I've had a couple of men. And I've wondered on those few occasions when I heard them say it, is this guy living in denial? <laughs> Or is he, of all people, one of the most fortunate? Because the truth is, for almost all of us, there's a pile of things we would change, if only we could. I have a, a memory from my years in Zambia. And most of you here know, especially after the children's time, that I lived in Central Africa, that's, goodness, 40 years ago now. And... Uh, that's where Kim, our daughter, our senior pastor here, was born when we were in Zambia. We were there shortly after Zambia gained its independence. My memory is of a, of a talk, a visit I had with a Roman Catholic priest. We were working together on a project introducing Christian education to the schools in Zambia. He was a wonderful man, this priest. He was one of the White Fathers. Uh, we used to call them the White Pops. Uh, they were wonderful missionaries. This man had been in Zambia for years. He spoke Nyanja fluently. And the day that I met with him, it was in a coffee shop, a uh, little cafe uh, not far from the outskirts of Lusaka, which is the capital city. And we had been there for a while when he said a strange thing. He said, I, I never like eating here. I have a bad memory about this place. And so I gave him a funny look, I guess, and so he told me the story. 
It was about 1954, 53, 54. He had first come to the country as a young priest. And he had stopped at this very same cafe, which was still operating. And it was a hot day. He'd ordered a sandwich and a coffee. A very pleasant lady who served him was a white person. The table he was shown to had a white cloth with a flower on it. And after she had seated him, she walked over to a side door that was open to serve an African who was standing there. My friend said, I realized that the African had been standing there when I came in. And I was served first, and then she went to talk to him. And she uh, handed him what looked like a lump of meat on a piece of dry bread. There was no niceties about it, no, no serviette, no napkin. And he took his food and he went out by the road and, and ate it amid the dust showers from the passing trucks. Back in the 1950s, that kind of scene was very common in northern Rhodesia, which was the name of the country at that time. Africans were not allowed into the nicer shops or restaurants. They were served through a side door or a side window, and they remained outside. I looked at him and I said, what did you do? Well, he sagged a little in his seat, and he said, nothing. I did nothing. That's why my memory of this place is so bad. I, I sat here, I felt bad, but I didn't do anything. What do you wish you had done, I asked him. And he, he said to me, I would give anything to go back and live that moment over so that I could go outside and sit beside the man and eat with him in the dust. And I remember feeling both sorrow and admiration for the man. Sorrow because it's amazing how bad memories never seem to leave us. Just when you think you've forgotten it, something will trigger it and it will come flooding back. And most of us have those kind of memories. Moments we would give almost anything to live over and to change. I also felt admiration for this man who had done so much for so many years that far more than made up for that one bad memory. Well, 2016 slipped away last night. It was not a happy year in so many ways. And its passing makes you one year older, <laughs> whether you like it or not. And this is the other side of the coin with time. Not only can we not move backwards, we can't even stand still. Have you ever wondered if it would be nice if, if we could have a pause button and kind of push the pause button for just a little while? But no, we, we have to rush forward into the future, even if we don't feel ready, and we don't know what's coming. We're just aware that we're growing older and that we're all on a one-way trip, and there's a sense of helplessness about it. When we're young, we don't think about it. Life seems to be eternal. It's amazing how quickly that view changes. The years slip by so quickly, and you look in the mirror, and suddenly you're not so young anymore. You look in the mirror and you think, I know that I'm well past my best before date. Where did time go? You remember that wonderful song that Tevye sings in Fiddler on the Roof? It's at his daughter's wedding, and he sings, Is this the little girl I carried? Is this the little girl at play? I don't remember growing older. When did she 
Sunrise, sunset, sunrise, sunset, swiftly fly the years, one season following another, laden with happiness and tears. So what does the Bible say, the book of Ecclesiastes, about the passing of time? The writer of Ecclesiastes was a preacher. At least, that's how the word Ecclesiastes is usually translated into English, the preacher. The Hebrew word is kohelet, and in ancient Hebrew, the word actually meant an assembly. Sometimes it meant the speaker of an assembly. So who was the preacher? Well, he was supposed to be King Solomon, the great King Solomon of old, full of wisdom. That's the only reason it got into the Bible at all. The book of Ecclesiastes was one of the last books to make the cut to get into the Bible. Uh, there were a lot of rabbis 1,500 years ago who didn't think it should be in. And the only reason it got in is because it was supposed to have been written by Solomon. So did Solomon write it? No, he did not. <laughs> Scholars are quite agreed that it was written long after the time of King Solomon. It's part of what is called the wisdom literature in the Bible. And the book is about the meaning and the folly of life. And it begins with the word vanity. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity, says the preacher. An interesting word, vanity. It comes from Latin. And the Latin word is vanus. You know what it means? It means empty. Vanity is something that has a good outward appearance, but inwardly is empty. So a vain person is someone who tries to look impressive, but inside there isn't much there. And vanity has about it a quality of being futile. It's rather like a great story I read about Harry Truman, who was the uh, 33rd president of the United States. Truman had been the vice president of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And it was just towards the close of the Second World War on the 12th of April, 1945, Roosevelt, who had been in failing health, died in office. And that pushed Truman into the top job. He wasn't really prepared for it, but suddenly he was the president. And the story is of the day he was sworn in as president, he had a chat with Sam Rayburn, who was the speaker of the House of Representatives. And Rayburn gave Harry Truman this wonderful piece of advice. Rayburn said, Harry, they, they were on a first name basis, literally, said, Harry, from here on in, you're going to have a lot of people around you. They're going to try to put a wall around you and cut you off from any ideas but their own. And Harry, they're going to tell you what a great man you are. But Harry, you and I both know you ain't. Well, it may be that Harry actually listened to Sam Rayburn, or maybe it's just the way he was, but one of the absolutely endearing qualities about Harry Truman that made him a very, very good president was that he had no inflated sense of self-importance. He remained to the end of his life an incredibly down-to-earth man. I was thinking about the current incoming president of the United States, I'm thinking he could learn an awful lot <laughs> if he read about the life of Harry Truman. But let me move on. A second observation that the preacher makes is that we're all in the same boat. All people share a common destiny. He says, doesn't matter whether you're good or bad, Rich or poor, wise or foolish, doesn't matter whether you go to the church, go to church and worship or you don't, we all have a common fate. 
Now, this is rather obvious. You might say it's even trite. But I think there is a deeper level to it. Barbara Ward was a, a British economist and writer. I, I read a lot of her books years ago. She's long gone now. She died in 1981. But Barbara Ward coined the term spaceship Earth. She said, our Earth is really nothing more than a quite tiny spaceship hurtling through space and time. And she said, we're all together on this spaceship, for better or for worse, for good or for ill, for richer or for poorer. We're all together in this little tiny spaceship. And because of this, we have one overwhelming interest in common. And that is to care for our tiny little spaceship and to care for each other. It's all we've got. It's in our overwhelming interest to care for our planet. It's our home. It makes no sense to do anything else. To say that we should ignore climate change in order to make a few people a little richer is nothing short of insanity. The third thing that the writer of Ecclesiastes says is that the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong. Success does not always come to the brilliant nor wealth to the learned, but time and chance happen to us all. And I think the bottom line is we have to come to terms with who we are and the gifts that God has given to each of us. And if that sounds easy, it's not. It's one of the most difficult things to do is to learn how to live with who you are and what you are. And it's hard because we look at others and we wish we had what they have. That person is better looking than I am. He's taller. He can do this. She can do that. If only, if only I could do that. Well, to use a, a not very churchy analogy, in the poker game of life, we're, we're all dealt a different hand. And it's not the hand we're given at birth that counts, but how we play it. So I want to close by asking you to imagine for a moment that you've won an amazing new lottery. Now, I know you never buy lottery tickets, but just imagine. And I'm going to call my amazing new lottery Everyday Lotterio. And the way it works is, when you win, Lotterio will deposit $86,400 into your personal bank account every day. 86400 you can spend it any way you want, but there are three rules. The first rule is that at the end of each day, any money you have not spent is going to be taken back and will be lost to you. Rule number two, you cannot transfer the money into any other account. You can't put it into a Swiss bank or anything like that. All you can do is spend it. But guess what? Tomorrow you're going to get another 86400 deposited into your account. And rule number three, Lotterio reserves the right to end the lottery game without warning at any time. Okay? So what would you do if you were the winner of this lottery? You could buy everything you ever wanted. Not just for yourself, but for those you love. You could even, and most of us here would, spend money on people you don't know. After all, you couldn't, after a while, you couldn't spend any more on yourself, why not help others? It would be an interesting challenge to spend every cent every day. Well, guess what? You've already won. Because each one of us here has just such a magical bank. It's called the Bank of Time. At midnight last night, as it ticked over, you were given 86,400 seconds of life as a gift. And when you go to bed tonight, anything you haven't used 
of those 86,400 seconds will be lost. Yesterday has always gone forever. And our account can be terminated at any time without warning. So my question to you is, what are you going to do today with what remains of your 86,400 seconds? You still right now have about 49,000 of them left. <laughs> Think about this fact. Those 49,000 seconds you have left are worth far, far, far more to you than any amount of money. According to Ecclesiastes, what we need is wisdom. Wisdom to live well. That's different from education. It's different from knowledge. It's not the same as Googling something. I think one of the wisest men I can remember was a, a Zambian elder. His name was uh, Mr. Mukwamba. When I knew him, he was in his 80s. He had very little education. Certainly, he had very little money. But he was an amazing man. The headmaster of our school used to consult with him regularly. I used to talk with him whenever I could. He was one of these people that you felt better just by being close to him and listening to him. And that's what wisdom is about. It's a gift of God, which is why the writer of Ecclesiastes concludes his book by advising us to remember our Creator in the days of our youth, before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken and dust returns to the earth as it was in the Spirit of, of God to God who gave it. Why should we remember our Creator? For one thing, it is God alone who stands outside time. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Life is short, and it's far, far better to seek the Spirit of Christ when its life is before you than after it's mostly gone. I have met so many people, both men and women, who have deep regrets over the last years of their life spent chasing after things that were absolutely vain and totally empty. Those who are wise seek the wonder of God's love and the power of his spirit because that alone will give you everything you need to live well. And remember, remember, the spirit we're talking about is the spirit of love. If it's not the Spirit of love, it is not the Spirit of Christ. If it is the Spirit of Christ, it will be a deeply loving Spirit. And I wish you that in, not, in the year 2017. The Spirit of love to fill your hearts and your minds and your spirit and everything you do. Happy New Year. May God bless you. Amen. Let us pray.